if countries and organizations could just follow the laws, that would be nice. Uh, NATO is a criminal organization since the bombing of Yugoslavia, where it had nothing to do, according to its own charter. It has been violating its own charter. Secondly, why have we accepted that self-defense means offensive deterrence? The main thing we need to change is the idea that we deter somebody and we do it offensively. That means as far away from ourselves as possible. When I if I say to you, my defense here will be able to smash up Japan where you sit, I've already said that I consider you an enemy. What I'm saying is the whole concept that we call defense today and security politics is wrong because it is by definition offensive. It cannot but lead to arms races and warfare. Everything NATO is built on is intellectual bullshit. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies, and today I'm talking to Dr. Jan Oberg, a Danish and Swedish peace researcher. Dr. Oberg holds a PhD in sociology from Lund University and an honorary doctorate from Soka University in Tokyo. He held teaching positions in Japan, Spain, Austria, Burundi, and Switzerland, and he is a co-founder and director of the Transnational Foundation for Peace and Future Research. He's also an outspoken critic of the current war mentality in Europe and the US. So today we want to discuss the big picture of war, peace, and maybe neutrality as well. Dr. Oberg, Jan, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm guilty of much, as you hear. <laughs> well, um, let's start with yourself, because you've been researching conflicts for over 40 years, I think, if, if I saw that correctly. Can you tell us a little bit about your work and what you what this led you to over the years, you know, in terms of insights about how conflict and wars <laughs> actually work? What's the framework that you're using to understand what's going on? Well, um, let me just quickly say that we are all inspired and standing on the shoulders of someone else. And I had a headmaster in my high school who was a Denmark's leading pacifist. And he was uh, one of the, the leaders of bringing 7,000 Jews during the Second World War in safety to Sweden, which was a dangerous thing to do. And then I studied sociology, came to Sweden, and there I had my first mentor, Håkan Wieberg, who was at professor of sociology here and gave a little course in peace research. And then I ran into Johan Galtum, mm. who sadly died earlier this year at the age of 93. And I was a friend of his uh, over 50 years. So I've been in very good hands when it comes to academia. And I'm a staunch believer <clears throat> in the idea that peace research means to exactly like medicine, reduce the baddies. And in this case, it is to reduce all types of violence. Um, and that is what Johan would call the negative piece. Uh, get rid of war and things like that. But also gender violence and violence against nature and all that. And then f the freed resources from that goes into positive peace. What kind of potentials do societies have the, when they kind of put, you know, violence behind them? Because we... we uh, we waste incredible sums on violence today, particularly in the Western world and particularly in the US NATO system. So I'm committed to, uh, if you will, nonviolence and uh, believe that uh, the biggest curse the Western world has at the moment de developed itself because it has no enemies. It makes enemies. It makes others enemies like China and Russia, etc. by its own behavior. But I'm a staunch believer in learning peace. Peace can be learned. Peace can be learned in the sense that we could teach each other how to deal with conflicts. Conflicts are okay. There will always be conflicts in a lively dynamic system, whether a marriage or a school or a political party or a democracy. What we must get rid of to survive as humanity and spend our resources better is to get rid of violence, reduce violence. So the parallel I see is medicine. You do diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. And what most peace researchers and most peace people and other good-hearted ones don't get to is what are we going to do about it? So you have a lot of people who are sitting now crying about the Third World War and uh, it will blow up and blah, blah, blah. We don't know. <clears throat> and I believe in not believing in that because people in power wants us to give up and be uh, 
you know, become defeatist and take another glass of wine instead of working for alternatives. There aren't all the alternatives that people once said. Well said, well said. There are, and there, there are ideas of what to do. Now, one of the ideas, and you talked about this in another talk, was is the United Nations. The idea of top-down, enforced peace, pyramid-like, like a, like a central state. It's the dream of Immanuel Kant, right? The perpetual peace under a world government. Um, a lot of people now are saying like that that dream is not only over, it's a nightmare, and we should get rid of the UN in general. Uh, generally because it's obviously not working i've seen you in another talk where you argued look it's not perfect but we can work with it can you maybe tell us about like what you think of how we could work with this imperfect institution of the un <laughs> well i wonder why we don't have similar discussions about nature which doesn't work etc now and most governments that don't work uh, either according to people's wishes um i am totally against those people who say we just closed down the UN. Because if there's nothing else left, there is the normative, the norm normative power of the UN and international law that is embedded with the UN, and that is the Charter. And the Charter has wonderful things such as, and this most Gandhian document that governments have ever signed, it says that war shall be abolished in the preamble. And in Article 1, it says that peace shall be established by peaceful means. And third, uh, Chapter 7 says that when everything has been tried with civilian nonviolent means, then the UN can organize a military force, let's say, to get an aggressor out of a country or prevent the genocide or whatever. Now, that to me is a brilliant piece of paper. And if we don't have that, if we scrap the whole thing, then we are... Uh, you know, I wouldn't say in the jungle because the jungle is a more beautiful system, a well-organized organic system, but you know what I mean. We will have a U.S. world instead of a U.N. world. So you can go back to the first Secretary General of the United Nations, the Norwegian Trukvili, and he said what is probably, in, in my view, the most fundamental about the U.N., the U.N. will never be stronger or better than the member states wants to make it. So those who will want to have a discussion about the U.N., I tell them, let's have a discussion about how, how your country is a UN member, how much it every day, 24-7, violates the UN Charter. Do what you should as a UN member, and the UN will be a brilliant organization. Give it 100 times bigger budget, because, as you know, as a final part of, of answering your question, we spent, the world spent three to 400 times more money on the militarism and warfare than it does on the UN. Now, I've worked with the UN here and there, not been employed, but I've worked with, for instance, in former Yugoslavia. They always get blurred mandates. They all get some very bad soldiers from member states. They all get some kind of, you know, we can cancel the whole thing if you don't do what we want. And they got this stupid agenda for peace, which said that peace could be enforced by violent means, etc. I worked against it behind the scenes, but they did get that. There are lots of problems with the UN. But for Christ's sake, before you have something better, make it better until you have something better. Don't scrap it. I would support that. And people people say, uh, <laughs> you know, international law is just as outdated as the UN because it doesn't work. But I need to ask you. So the problem that it doesn't work as it is intended to, what do you say about that? And secondly, you're right. The UN Charter is a wonderful document and it outlaws uh, war and so on and so forth. But... It brings it back in. It sneaks it back in through Article 51, through the back door by saying that, you know, uh, it's you're still allowed, countries are still allowed to violently defend themselves and even worse, collectively defend themselves, which is what all the NATO countries right now are preaching from their pulpits, right? We are only helping Ukraine to defend itself in accordance with the UN Charter, Article 51. Um, and every goddamn war since the Second World War has been fought basically more or less on uh, with the excuse of Article 51. How can we rectify that one? That is a difficult one, I agree. And of course, this is the, um, the uh, jumping ground that they are using. That is Article 51 about the right to self-defense. <laughs> you even hear Israel argue that, about that at the moment when it does a genocide in the name of self-defense. But the long story short about this is, who said that we should have self-defense their way? We have it now. 
question mark. If you read the NATO treaty, I think you and I could sign that tomorrow or today. It is totally defensive. It's a copy of the UN Charter. It says in paragraph, um, Article 5 of the NATO treaty that our only extra obligation is to support a country which a member state of the alliance who have been attacked. Now, that is a defensive thing. That's the first thing. If Again, if, if countries and organizations could just follow the laws, that would be nice. Uh, NATO is a criminal organization since the bombing of Yugoslavia, where it had nothing to do, according to its own charter. It has been violating its own charter, and somebody somewhere in the international uh, system should investigate NATO for, you know, for 25 years, having broken its own um, agenda, its own statutes. That's a serious thing. Secondly, why have we accepted that self-defense means offensive deterrence? Most countries argue today that my defense consists in being able to kill you 5,000 kilometers away with my missiles. That's not defense. If you want to deter, it must be defensive. If you want to have defensive, and as long as there's a democracy where some people want to carry weapons, we have to accept that there are some people who carry weapons, and therefore you must have a combi defense. But the main thing we need to change is the idea that we deter somebody and we do it offensively. That means as far away from ourselves as possible. When I, If I say to you, my defense here will be able to smash up Japan where you sit, I've already said that I consider you an enemy. If, there, if instead I built a Chinese wall, you know, with modern technology, and I'm not saying for all physically, but it's a, it's a symbol of defensive defense. It only works when somebody comes to you and tries to do something bad to you, then we'll give you hell. So defensive defense is a combination of smaller destructive power, short range, mm -hmm. density and mobility. If you want to talk military terms, I don't mind that. I would like to see a world only with nonviolent defense and nonviolent non conflict resolution and all that. But in a democracy, you know, some people want to carry weapons. So we have to accommodate those people until everybody comes to their senses and decide that we don't need a military like Costa Rica or whatever. But I, 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 what I'm saying is the whole concept that we call defense today and security politics is wrong because it is by definition offensive. It cannot but lead to arms races and warfare. Everything NATO is built on is intellectual bullshit. It cannot make peace by that theory of offensive deterrence and then adding, you know, that every country around the world is our enemy because, as they said about China at the moment, at its homepage, it's a, it's a challenge because they are different from us and have different values from us. I mean, in that case, there are many, many countries where your enemy is. So this missionary idea is sick, but it's, it suits the idea of offensive deterrence and that creates enemies, whereas self-defense, according to Article 51, could be constructed so that it was only self-defense until we can phase out military completely. Finally, let me quote Johan Galton. Don't start out with security leading to peace. Start out, make peace and secured by alternative defense, civilian and military. You know, we have a security discussion all the time. In the Western world today, you cannot mention the word peace. You cannot say the word peace. You cannot ask a prime minister, how does that make peace? Because the answer will be, and that it was also Stoltenberg's of NATO's uh, argument, the road to peace is warfare. I mean, we're in a sick, sick culture that thinks like that, but there are lots of alternatives, but we're not supposed to discuss them. There are lots of ways of securing and making peace in the world that we could do, but the military, industrial, media, academic complex, MIMAC, prevents us from doing that also because of the influence they have on the media to make you believe that the only way to solve Ukraine is to bomb and to occupy and to even risk a nuclear war. Very well said, very well said. The The thing that doesn't, that, that I cannot explain to myself is how it is that within that framework that you just laid out for us, which a lot of people 
in the collective West, if we want to use that term, um, certainly in Europe, in, in, in North America, in, especially in the universities where they teach international relations, security studies, what doesn't get into my mind or what I don't understand is like, why is it that in this environment, it is well understood and it, it's a basic tenet that the security dilemma is a real thing. And the security dilemma is, of course, what gives rise to this, my offensive defense is your is your uh, uh, threat. And, and that threat perception will lead you to one up the other one and you land up in an arms race and you you and you end up in um well in, in 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 great great danger of great great war right and this is understood and the same people who research mm -hmm. are the ones who then tell you but we need the bigger bombs than the other one and if the other one builds a new bomb they 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 say like but they are evil they are evil but they teach it and I've I've seen that I've heard that in Japan people who teach the security dilemma and do not understand that if Japan upgrades its military its its military forces that then china will perceive that as a threat they keep arguing but china should know that this is just self defensive we does this can you explain this okay maybe this is too much of a question of psychology but maybe you've come across yeah it. but let's see <clears throat> no it's very much a matter of psychology because you built up the image with citizens that we are threatened, that there are enemies all over the place. I mean, let me just quote you one of the more bizarre, absurd theater arguments. Uh, the, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, the Danish prime minister had the guts to say, she's a, she's a social democratic woman, she had the guts to say that if we don't stop Hamas in the Middle East, they will come to Denmark too. You know, that's the level we're at. So there's psychology to it. If you, I mean, it's called fearology. If you make people through the media, through the, you know, concerted efforts of the MIMAC I mentioned, the military industrial media academic complex, make people believe that they are threatened, they will accept whatever. You look at, you look at all the taxpayers in Europe now whose money are being, being wasted in the billions, the hundreds of billions of euros on a war that is already lost. And which should never have happened because it would not have happened if NATO had not tried to expand, first of all, you know, 10 countries and then trying Ukraine also against all the promises we gave Gorbachev. It's a, that's a long story. But the idea that you can threaten people, make them feel, uh, you know, the enemy is coming around the corner. Russia is terrible. They're going to eat us all, right? Now, I've been living since uh, 51, and I've been hearing that the Russians are coming. There's not one example of Russia having invaded a NATO country or a neutral state. It's all invention. It's all, you know, it's, 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 it's um, narratives that have taken over reality. These guys don't live in the reality anymore. You have top leading Swedish people, where I said, Swedish military top people, brass, who says we must prepare for Putin, Putin, Vladimir Putin, Russia slash Russia, invading and doing a partial occupation of southern Sweden. You know, I'd like to see the scenario, and there's no media people who even ask the question, excuse me, what is the scenario that leads Russia to, to land on the coast of southern Sweden, where I happen to basically sit? There's nobody answering the question because you have the media academic complex of you have the media as part of the warfare and the fearology and that's why it's very difficult we're just small corners around the world where we're discussing alternatives to this because you can't get through with it you can't do that at state financed institutes you could look at CIPRI in Stockholm the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute they don't do peace research anymore if they ever did but they certainly don't do it they do it security studies you can even see it on top of their homepage it now says that it's it's a it's a leading source on international security. The peace has been dropped. And they are working with the Munich Security Conference, etc. I mean, Alva Myrdal, who was the brain behind it when starting it, whom I had the honor to meet a couple of times, must be rotated in, his, in her grave. Most of the peace research institutes in Scandinavia don't do peace research in the sense I defined it as reducing violence. So it's not so strange that this is difficult because they have a monopoly on telling you citizens that you must fear and we take care of your security if you pay us your taxpayers' money and enough of it. And now you have a situation because we have made history's biggest blunder in trying to make Ukraine a member of NATO. You spend more and more and more on 
a war that will not succeed. And you will not succeed in breaking up Russia and all these kinds of bizarre ideas. But who pays the bill? That's why I think a very effective movement would be a peace movement that um, refused to pay that percentage of the country's national budget that goes to the military, put it into a, a fund and said, when you behave yourself and you, you do people security, um, security that we can see a result of, then when you make peace, we'll pay out what is in that. And until then, the military can go and make, you know, bake sales and sell coffee and things like that to finance the wars they want to have. You know, we, we, we're talking about something which is a fundamental, uh, what do you call that? Doris Lessing called it shikasta. You know, the, the great civilizational malaise that we believe in militarism. And now it's come because the U.S. is going down um, and the empire is going down. It's it's now coming to the top because that is the last thing the West is good at. That is to produce weapons. We've lost all the wars, but we are very good at, at developing the military, industrial, media, academic complex. So I'm not so surprised that it's difficult, but it's going to happen at some point. I would say when the U.S. empire falls, NATO falls, and then we have all opportunities to create a globally humanities security system. But we Europeans have been screwing it up for the last 500 years. I mean, we have a history of screwing up <laughs> peace time and again. We managed to lose the peace after the Cold War. And we, we, we it, didn't just exactly. Slip through, exactly. it didn't just slip through our fingers. We, sh we threw it on the floor. We stepped on it and then Under we the shunned bus. anyone. <laughs> and then we shunned anyone who, who pointed out that, that we, we are not acting uh, responsibly here. Um, it's just I can't wrap my head around the fact that so many people go along with this. That okay, I understand that you and I we we have these professions and we 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 think about these matters on a, on on a daily basis. But that it is so easy to feed such dumb narratives, such stupid versions of reality, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like the Russians are the baddies and the Ukrainians are the goodies and 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 the, the, the Americans are the other other white the white knight on a shining. Uh, on on uh, the 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 shining knight on a white horse or whatever you know this 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 victimhood narrative the victimhood narrative of the Israelis of like no no this genocide is necessary because they are just protecting themselves against uh, evil that just wants to randomly kill uh, poor Jews it is it's so dumb and it is so transparently dumb and actually a large part of the world <laughs> sees it and the Europeans we just they they like not everybody I mean twenty five thirty percent don't go along but seventy percent just nod and say like yeah that's what we need. Why? You could add that, which is new. Uh, I, I totally agree with you. NATO should have been abolished uh, in 91 because well, the Warsaw Pact and uh, the Soviet Union disappeared. And I remember when I, excuse me, when I wrote my dissertation in the 70s, um, uh, I went down to NATO as a young student and interviewed people there, not at the very highest level, but reasonably high level. They all said the same. I come from a generation, my parents knew what war was. I'm sitting here at NATO because we don't want it to happen again. There must never be war again. And the main thing is, or the reason we are here, is the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. And so I logically drew the conclusion that NATO would disappear when the Warsaw Pact and the Soviet Union disappear. And these fools, of course, uh, around, particularly the Clinton, called Not One Inch, uh, 550 pages. Uh, I'm just right now forgetting the story. The author but it is called Not One Inch. And it's all well documented that what we did instead was to do exactly what we promised Gorbachev not to do, that was to expand NATO. And NATO, of course, it today, the only raison d'etre of NATO is expansion. It has nothing to give the world anymore. Its concept, its philosophy, its uh, theories and concepts are totally, as I said, intellectual bullshit. But that cannot, it's a church. It's for people who believe it. It's not for people who have an intellectual mind and look at what is it would be useful for the world. So um, the, the, the banality of this, uh, let me say this as a deeper level, um, Pascal has also to do with the fact that we are Christian culture. Everything is divided into dichotomies, good and bad, left and right. 
and you can go online, women or men or whatever, you know. And that applies to the Russia also, which is basically Western culture or Western world. And wanted to, by the way, be part of the West. Now, long story short, when you have those underlying social cosmology or what you would call it, and you add to that the ability to dominate by military means, because you have been the leader of the world, you have a very dangerous cocktail. And you don't see it. You know, cosmology is defined by something we operate on, but it's not that easy to see it. You can see it from the outside. Now, if you take the Chinese, they build on the five principles of peaceful coexistence that Chu and Lai and, uh, and Nero put together uh, 70 years ago. And that's a completely different way of thinking. That is non-interference in somebody else's uh, political system. That's why you don't see the Chinese exporting today the idea of, you know, one-party systems or mixed economies or Confucianism. They simply say, we don't care what kind of people you are, but can we do some business together? And can we do benefits? Can we do win-win with a kind of equal sharing of the benefits? It's a completely different way of going. It's a much more defensive way of thinking. The, the, the uh, Chinese have not built bases around the world. The Americans have 650 bases in under 30 countries. You can go on like that. I mean, it, we had, I think we, to answer your question about how is it possible, it is possible because what we do is so much inside the ways we think in Western civilization, if it is a civilization. But the cosmology is, it's natural what we do. It's natural that we go out and dominate everybody and go out and go make anybody our consumers of Coca-Cola or democracy or human rights or whatever. And that is now coming to an end because things like the like the different wars, the war on terror, um, the Gaza genocide, the Ukraine war, the destruction of Nord Stream are all nails in the coffee of that Western dominance. I'm not so pessimistic about the future because the West is unfortunately into a self-destructive process. We do all the things and we are 12, 11, 12 percent of humanity. All the other 88% see what we do in Gaza and they say they cannot lead the world in the future. It's very sad. It's very, very sad. I've never been anti-Western. I'm a product of the Western culture and cosmology. And I see only self-destruction. The Chinese and the Russians are not going to be destroyed by this. We are going to destroy it ourselves because we have all these enemy images. We waste our money on militarism and our societies will break apart. There's nothing that works in the Western world anymore. I don't, I haven't, can't remember having been on a train in Sweden that goes on time. It did when I came to Sweden 52 years ago. That was an order and things worked. It doesn't work today. The, the fear that I have. We are under, undermining our own strengths. The fear, the fear that I have is that um, the Western cosmology itself, and I think that's a good expression of it, is, although highly violent and, and quite destructive and even to a good degree self-destructive, it, it is extremely good at creating the very environment that it itself uh, conjures up you know, to create your own enemies, right? Uh, that, that's part of what this cosmology needs, right? It's, it's You need an enemy. You need a significant other. Yes. And, yes. and unfortunately, yes. yeah. it's yeah. quite good at forming those. And just like as we see now, you know, um, exactly. the, the West basically okays attackums, attacks on uh, on Russia. And then Russia shoots back a new a new kind of missile. And then the West goes like, look, we told you they're so evil. They are, they're, they're exactly the enemies that we've told you they are. And they do the same with the Chinese. Exactly. So yeah. it it sucks in the others, right? So aren't you worried that we might we might land ourselves in the third world war that we conjure up ourselves? Yes, I am. And I've always made the probably provocative uh, comparison. What would Hitler have done in his bunker in Berlin if he had had nuclear weapons? Mm. You know, Gorbachev was a very decent visionary person. He knew that his system was going down and he wanted to work with the West. Um, and I consider him a very great statesman, although he then made some mistakes. And in the eyes of the Chinese, he did the terrible mistake of multi-party system and all that. That's a long story. But he did recognize and that the, his system was over. 
and that he needed to get the best out of it, including leaving Afghanistan and, you know, putting, letting Sakharov be on free food, etc. And then he said, hey, how are we going to cooperate? How do we create a new European home where we don't have this militarism and this bloc confrontation and all that? So uh, <clears throat> that's what I am not sure, or rather I'm sure we don't have such personalities, such leaders in the Western world, in the NATO countries, or in the United States. So yes, uh, <clears throat> that means you may see two um, scenarios, very roughly, uh, more of course, but one scenario would be the United States empire implodes, it, it, it kind of disintegrates from the inside. Things that doesn't work anymore, um, infrastructure that doesn't work, um, nobody ob obeying anymore, too many conflicts inside NATO, etc. The other one, of course, is the explosion scenario. And that is when you find out that your system is at the end, when your empire has come to what all empires do, they go down, there's no empire that lasts forever. And this, by the way, will be the last because the Chinese are not so stupid that they will build a new empire and try to rule the world. And it's not in their genes. I, it's not in their cosmology to do that. Uh, then you may see somebody sitting in the White House blowing up the whole thing, you know, throwing tactical nuclear weapons somewhere else. And when we talk about Europe, I must say, I wonder, which is even to me a larger enigma than the one you mentioned before, how come that the European politicians, leaders, whatever, and citizens accept to be slaughtered in a nuclear war in Europe started by NATO, which is led by the US. You know, if we have a, around, if, if God forbid, if Ukraine leads to an exchange of very serious conventional weapons or tactical nuclear weapons in Europe, we are the ones paying the price, not the, Amer not the Americans. This is not going to be intercontinental ballistic missiles. It'll be on the battlefield of Europe. Where, you, where I'm sitting. I can't understand that there's not even that sense of decency among European leaders to say, we are not going to be the victims of this policy that NATO has now been doing for 30 years, trying to get Ukraine into it. They are all supporting this. We're going to win over Russia and we are going to make Ukraine and NATO and all that. It's completely inside the narrative. It has nothing to do with the reality. And that, when, when, when a whole civilization and p people in power, people who sit on tons of weapons, including nuclear power, nuclear weapons, are no longer using rational analysis, but are into emotional groupthink, then it is dangerous. And I'm not sitting here saying it's not dangerous, but I refuse to be deterred by the danger and give up. Yeah. That's why I see it as my job as a peace researcher to say, hey, there are 300 alternatives to this road. I'm very, glad, nuclear war. I'm very glad that you're doing that and I very much agree um I I am very um, I am very afraid that Europe at the moment is at this ideological moment which actually the you know the greater Euro Europe has uh once in a while and actually not just Europe actually the Eurasia in general I maybe it's 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 a general thing like there are there are ideological moments where entire civilizations start destroying themselves the russians did so uh between like 1917 and then the 1950s which with the bolshevik revolution and and also the purge of their own people the chinese did it too the i mean the great leap forward the cultural revolution great leap forward those were moments when they destroyed their own cultural heritage and the Soviet Union basically eroded from 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 within, and maybe right now Europe is in that thing, and this is going to be extremely dangerous. I mean, the Nazis were in that. I mean, I mean, genociding like millions of your own people. You don't do that when you're a healthy society, right? Uh, okay. The Israelis are probably there as well, um, because these are the same people like living living on the same plot of land, right? You're killing the people that that you your part of your prosperity is built upon. So. Um, Sure. I think that's a very, very valid uh, global comparison that you're making. Why do empires fall? They fall not because only because they are conquered or invaded by somebody else. They fall but because of internal factors. They overdo something. Um, they become self-destructive. Uh, and I'm afraid that nobody in the Western political sphere 
I mean, the formal political sphere sees how self-destructive the whole thing is at the moment. I don't think Madame von der Leyen has any idea about anything, but we're going to win, no matter the price. The Danish prime minister I mentioned has the same attitude. Now Sweden and Finland, as you know, are NATO members. They don't have any independent thoughts left. They just go with the, with the flock, and the flock says we're going to you know, win in, over Russia in Ukraine. That could go madly wrong, but it can also simply fall apart for them. That's what I still hope for. But the main thing is that those people who work against all this should become constructive. They should become doctors. They should look at healing and treatment, even if it sounds unrealistic. Because, and that's what I always quote, the queen of peace research, Elisa Boulding, always said, well, you cannot make people work for something that they cannot imagine. So, you know, all these peace people and security experts and others who sit and have seminars these very weeks and months about, you know, the Third World War and nuclear war and it's coming soon and all that. I say, shut up. This is not helpful. One, you don't know what will release a nuclear war. Two, you don't know that it will happen. Three, think of something else. Be more constructive. Because the more you talk about the risk of nuclear war, the more you support the military, industrial, media, academic complex, and all the best that's were militarizing this culture to death. You are participating because you lack creativity about possible alternatives. And Pascal, if you and I go to a doctor and he or she makes a diagnosis and a prognosis and say, you'll be dead in one year because you have this and that disease, you don't think it's a very good doctor. You'll go to another one and say, hmm, doctor, what can be done about it so I don't die? And that's what peace movement people and others should begin to do. And they are not peace movements. They are anti-militarist movements. It sounds now like I'm very critical. I know it's part of the same thing. You have to do critical thinking. You have to do a diagnosis, uh, what will happen if this continues, and then you have to come up with alternatives. The last part is what the military-industrial uh, complex thrives from that so few researchers, movements, etc., and politicians are thinking of the possible, the perfectly possible alternatives to this road. You cannot, you cannot get a discussion going at the moment. I'm totally excluded from Danish and Swedish media, which I was not 20, 30 years ago, because they know that I will say it's easy to make peace in, in Ukraine. You know, if if I begin to say that. People think this is really dangerous. Stop that man. For what reason? The reason is that decision makers, politicians, parliamentarians, they always criticize each other. They are criticized by the media and editorials. Editors in chief, they are criticized by the people. Critics, criticism doesn't change the world. What changes the world is that people say, hey, it could be done differently. We could do this much more smart way. That's when politicians say, oh, oops, somebody has better ideas than we think we have. So I always quote, and sorry if you heard me say this before, but I think it's so precisely a diagnosis of our time. It's George Bernard Shaw, the Irish Dublin, -er, Dublin author, who said, most people think of the, look at the world and ask why. You know, why is it, has it all these problems? What we should do is to look at the world as it could be and ask why not. This is a, that's this what I do, and that's what I think peace research is about. It's a, it's, a, it's a good approach. It's a good approach. And since you are already like throwing over the medical met metaphor, I would like to throw back this uh, my basic um, motivation to do what I do, which is that I look mm. at war as a cancer. And yep. if the cancer gets too bad, it will devour the entire body of the of humanity. And there's two exactly. approaches to he to work with that. One is to try to heal the cancer and to make it go away completely, which to me is the United Nations approach, the top down, <laughs> let's get rid of war. Uh, mm. The other way is an older way, um, but that's one that we that we are not using anymore, which is to try to isolate it. Don't try to radiate it away. Try to make sure that it doesn't spread. And neutrality is actually the antidote for that. If, yes. you, keep, yes. if, if, you, if you spread cordon sanitaires of neutrality, then you might not get rid of all the wars, but mm -hmm. they might remain small and local and resolve Brilliant. themselves because they will run out of steam. What is your thought on that? 
I think your idea, your, the way you distinguish between the two approaches is brilliant, Pascal. Thank you for <laughs> giving me that. Um, I think that, that um, if you say isolation, uh, you could say, I mean, I'm just trying this on you as uh, two intellectuals uh, you know, throwing things at each other and see how the other reacts. You know, a good dialogue ends with question marks, not with exclamation marks. Um, I would say, don't you see the present 11, 12 percent of the world who we call the West as isolating itself? You yeah. know, I don't see around the world. I don't when I'm in China and talk with people. I don't see any fascination with the military. I don't see any fascination with warfare. They talk peace. I was just invited to this uh, celebration of the five principles. I'm sat there listening in the people's hall to the, to uh, President Xi Jinping and the foreign minister, etc. All talking for hours about peace, how to structure the world so we can be more peaceful, how not to dominate other countries, etc. And people say, oh, okay, you're paid by the Communist Party. No, I'm not. Well, I'm just saying there's such a different approach to it, whereas anybody you listen to in the Western world today is talking about warfare and the risk of war and threats and what we must guard ourselves against. I mean, I've written it and I stand for it. The Western world has become mentally ill. And that's very sad. But I think that isolation is coming. People are sick and tired of looking at 650 U.S. bases around the world. Go to Okinawa, close to where you sit. I've been there. So the long story short is militarism, when it gets overboard, when it, it it's overdeveloped, will be its own cancer eating of itself. And then uh, you can say that's very sad. And yes, uh, if the West does not have the intellectual capacity to rescue itself from over-militarization, to militarize itself to death, there's nothing we can do about it. It's just one more empire going down. And as I said, it will be the last because it's not in the genes of the Japanese or the Chinese to build empires because the empire is built on missionary thinking. Others must be like us. If you look at what the Chinese are saying, they don't want others to be like the Chinese. Chinese, want, like the Japanese, want to be specific, unique, and themselves. They're not trying to make everybody Confucianists or something like that. It's very fascinating because people always say with a new multipolar, multinodal work, oh, China will just become the new empire. How naive you are, Jan. I think it's very naive to believe that the Chinese will build an empire modeled upon the United States of America or the British Empire or, you know, I don't think they will. I can't prove that they won't, but I see nothing in their social cosmology that would lead to that. Yeah, this is the, this is where you and 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 uh, Jeffrey Sachs would agree with each other, and where you stand in like uh, <laughs> in opposite to John Mearsheimer, because John Mearsheimer, for all the brilliant analysis, which is rooted in reality and in actual, in yeah. in, in recognition of the different the different actors and 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 their motivational factors, <laughs> he still at the end of the day projects European. Uh, motivations into the Chinese, which is why he yes. thinks they will act exactly like the European, of which you know, exactly. the American, not yeah, American, yeah. but just the greatest respect European for him. Bear. But I think he's wrong on that one. <laughs> so, um, this is, I mean, this is very useful. The question then just is, how can we? Help, and by we, I mean really mean the we as you and I, plus everybody listening. Who are sitting in who are sitting in 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 China, in Indonesia, in Thailand, in but also in the US and in the UK and 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 in Europe, the people who actually share this vision. How do we help to lay the old Euro-American empire to rest in a peaceful way? Let it let it let it let it go down peacefully, the way more or less the Soviet Union went peacefully away, um, without you know blowing up. To me, this is like it's like it's like raw eggs, and if one of them drops, then boom. So how do we not drop the eggs? That's a very good question again, Pascal. I enjoy this conversation, which is not an interview but a conversation. Um, I think that that I wrote some years ago, also inspired by Johan Galtung, who said, "Is there anybody who can help the United States?" You know, he predicted it it would fall as an empire. We're not, let me make that clear to your viewers. I'm not talking about the U.S. as a society. I'm talking about the empire. 
And of course, empires cost so much that they eat up the resources at some point that you need for your own society. And that's what you can see in the infrastructure in the United States today and the poverty and all that. But but he said, who can help the United States? And the answer was only its friends. And I think that, uh, unfortunately, the friends of the United States, which is basically Europe and allies in the in the NATO countries, are not able to do that. I thought of that uh, some years ago. I thought it was a good idea, a good point of view. Who can help? Well, you can tell a friend you are on the wrong track, and you're drinking too much, you are spending too much weapons, money. Uh, but I'm not sure because Europe has proved to now if not before, proved that it doesn't have an independent policy of the United States. It accepts, you know, things like the destruction of Nord Stream. It, it accepts the sanctions, uh, etc. So I'm pretty pessimistic on that one. My hope would be that simply things slowly but in a reasonably orderly way falls apart in the Western world so that at some point somebody will come up in the Western world and say, let's join them because we can't beat them. And that should happen before the United States and NATO, uh, et cetera, has, has crumbled completely in a war. And you and I can only sit and speculate about that because the war we all fear, uh, but which I refuse to be deterred by in my work and my private life, could happen this afternoon. You've got to, you've got to recognize that that is the situation we're in. But that also should lead everyone who is paid tons of money to the military system called NATO to ask why the hell did that alliance who promised us peace end up being the main actor and the main fighter of wars. So, I mean, the, the process down could be something that makes people think. We were told blah, 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 and today we're in the opposite situation. We were told that peace would come with money and weapons. It doesn't. And as somebody said, if, if weapons were a road to peace, we would have had peace long ago. So the first thing is re self-reflection. What has gone so wrong compared with what we were told? And the other thing will be then to sit down and have future seminars. It will be to do white books. It will do to talk only about or alternatives. The reason being, as long as we talk about the war, we talk the uh, we are within the agenda and the discourse of the militarists, and we are in a defensive position, saying we are against NATO membership for Sweden, or we are against this weapon, or we are against war, or we are against this and that. They set the agenda. If you begin to say, "Hey, we could do things completely differently," look here. There are good examples in the world. It can be done differently. Conflict resolution, nonviolence, thinking in the future, better world order, multipolar, alternative defense. Maybe somebody, I can only hope for that. Maybe somebody will fall out their ears and say, oh, shit, I never thought of that. And that's what makes the world change. That's when people say, I've never thought of that. It doesn't make the world change to say that the war is coming tomorrow. That's where I'm very hesitant to say what I just said to you. But on the other hand, I'm not sitting here playing naive and believing that there cannot be a war because there could very well be a war because of Ukraine. Of course. No, but this is not because of Ukraine. Sorry, but but the, the no, conflict no, formation no. that led to the war in Ukraine. And now I, let me be precise. <laughs> no, completely agree. Uh, this is probably where we just at some point have to use uh, uh, an advice I once got from my best philosophy uh, professor uh, as an undergrad. Say like, if you want to, if you want to disagree with somebody and you want them not to shut down, you just need to lie to their faces and tell them I completely agree with you. <laughs> and and whatever comes after the end can be the opposite of what they just told mm. you. But you need to mm. tell them first that you agree with them, in order yeah. to keep them open to the suggestion. Um, we have to keep this discussion open, Jan, um, but I do have to leave. So um, if people want to read your writings or to follow you, where should they go? Well, we are basically in two places. We are at uh, transnational.live, our main homepage, the foundation homepage with um, archives back to 1986 when we started this work which is devoted to the Article 1, making peace by peaceful means. That's what we are here for. And then we have a um, fast-growing um, presence on Substack. Mm. Also now with a lot of videos, because I belong to <laughs> the expanding group of people who have now been uh, thrown out of YouTube as well as um, 
Vimeo, uh, you can't log in, you cannot do this. So we put all the videos, for instance, the video you now put on, on, on neutrality studies videos on your YouTube channel, we will take over and, and post on uh, Substack. So uh, that's what we do. And then we are frequently on all kinds of social media too. We're trying to use the, the opportunities that, that they give us, but we are also getting smaller and smaller, for instance, on Facebook. Um, we can live with that. We're growing very fast in um, in Chinese and other non-Western media because the West, the rest of the world is looking for peace and the Western world is looking for more war and militarism. So hey, I'm fairly optimistic, but transnational.live is where you will have the road into everything else we do. Okay, okay. I'll put all thank of that into the, into the description below. Uh, Jan Olberg, thank you very much for your time today. Well, thank you so much for the good conversation. I really enjoyed it.